Sermon on the Mount The Sermon on the Mount is a collection of sayings and teachings of Jesus Christ, which emphasizes his moral teaching found in the Gospel of Matthew. It is the first of the five discourses of Matthew and takes place relatively yearly in the ministry of Jesus after he has been baptized by John the Baptist, had fasted and contemplated in the desert, and began to preach in Galilee. The sermon is the longest continuous discourse of Jesus found in the New Testament, and has been one of the most widely quoted elements of the canonical gospel stat it includes some of the best known teachings of Jesus, such as the Beatitudes, and the widely recited Lord's Prayer. The Sermon on the Mount is generally considered to contain the central tenets of Christian discipleship. The Sermon on the Mount is Jesus' longest speech and teaching in the New Testament, and occupies chapters 5, 6 and 7 of the Gospel of Matthew. The Sermon has been one of the most widely quoted elements of the canonical Gospels. This is the first of the five discourses of Matthew, the other four being Matthew 10, Matthew 13, Matthew 18 and the Olivet Discourse in Matthew 24. The sermon is set early in the ministry of Jesus, after he has been baptized by John the Baptist in chapter 3 of Matthew's Gospel, gathered his first disciples in chapter 4, and had returned from a long fast and contemplation in the Judean desert where he had been tempted by Satan to renounce his spiritual mission on gain worldly riches. Before this episode, Jesus had been all about Galilee preaching, as in, and great crowds followed him from all around the area. The setting for the sermon is given in. Jesus sees the multitudes, goes up into the mountain, is followed by his disciples, and begins to preach. The sermon is brought to its close by, which reports that Jesus came down from the mountain followed by great multitudes. While the issue of the exact theological structure and composition of the Sermon on the Mount is subject to debate among scholars, specific components within it, each associated with particular teachings, can be identified. In almost all cases the phrases used in the Beatitudes are familiar from an Old Testament context, but in the sermon Jesus gives them new meaning. Together, the Beatitudes present a new set of ideals that focus on love and humility rather than force and exaction, they echo the highest ideals of Jesus' teachings in spirituality and compassion. In Christian teachings, the works of mercy, which have corporal and spiritual components, have resonated with the theme of the Beatitude for Mercy. These teachings emphasize that these acts of mercy provide both temporal and spiritual benefits. There are two parts in this section, using the term salt of the earth and light of the world to refer to the disciples implying their value. Elsewhere, in, Jesus applies light of the world to himself. Jesus preaches about hell and what hell is like, but I say unto you, that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment, and whosoever shall say to his brother Raka shall be in danger of the council, but whosoever shall say, Thou fool, shall be in danger of hellfire. Matthew 5:22. Kjad longest discourse in the sermon is, traditionally referred to as the Antitheses or Matthew's Antitheses though Gundari disputes that title. In the discourse, Jesus fulfills and reinterprets the Old Covenant and in particular its Ten Commandments, contrasting with what you have heard from others. For example, he advises turning the other cheek, and, in contrast to taking an eye for an eye. According to most interpretations of, and, and most Christian views of the Old Covenant, these new interpretations of the Law and Prophets are not opposed to the Old Testament, which was the position of Martian, but form Jesus' new teachings which bring about salvation, and hence must be adhered to, as emphasized in towards the end of the sermon. In Matthew 6 Jesus condemns doing what would normally be good works simply for recognition and not from the heart, such as those of alms, prayer, and fasting. The discourse goes on to condemn the superficiality of materialism and call the disciples not to worry about material needs, but to seek God's kingdom first. Within the discourse on ostentation, Matthew presents an example of correct prayer. Luke places this in a different context. The Lord's Prayer contains parallels to the first part of Matthew 7, i.e. deals with judging. Jesus condemns those who judge others before first judging themselves, judge not, that ye be not judged. In the last part in Jesus concludes the sermon by warning against false prophets. The teachings of the Sermon on the Mount have been a key element of Christian ethics, and for centuries the sermon has acted as a fundamental recipe for the conduct of the followers of Jesus. Various religious and moral thinkers have admired its message and it has been one of the main sources of Christian pacifism. In the 5th century, St. Augustine began his book Our Lord's Sermon on the Mount by stating, The last verse of chapter 5 of Matthew, is a focal point of the sermon that summarizes its teachings by advising the disciples to seek perfection. 
The Greek word teleos used to refer to perfection also implies an end, or destination, advising the disciples to seek the path towards perfection in the kingdom of God. It teaches that God's children are those who act like God. The teachings of the sermon are often referred to as the ethics of the kingdom. They place a high level of emphasis on purity of the heart and embody the basic standard of Christian righteousness. The issue of the theological structure and composition of the Sermon on the Mount remains unresolved. One group of theologians ranging from St. Augustine in the 5th century to Michael Golder in the 20th century, see the Beatitudes as the central element of the Sermon. Others such as Borncom see the Sermon arranged around the Lord's Prayer, while Daniel Patty, closely followed by Ulrich Luz, see a chiastic structure in the Sermon. Dale Allison and Glenn Stassen have proposed a structure based on triads. Jack Kingsbury and Hans Dieter Betz see the sermon as composed of theological themes, for example righteousness or way of life. The high ethical standards of the sermon have been interpreted in a wide variety of ways by different Christian groups and Craig S. Keener states that at least 36 different interpretations regarding the message of the sermon exist, which he divides into eight categories of views Anabaptist groups would hold the Sermon on the Mount to be the primary section of the Gospels that gives direction to how a Christian should live. For example, Matthew 6:24 says no man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one, and love the other, or else he will hold to the one, and despise the other. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. For this reason, certain Anabaptist groups such as the Bruderhof and Hutterites share all their possessions. While Matthew groups Jesus' teachings into sets of similar material, the same material is scattered when found in Luke. The Sermon on the Mount may be compared with the similar but more succinct Sermon on the Plain as recounted by the Gospel of Luke, which occurs at the same moment in Luke's narrative, and also features Jesus heading up a mountain, but giving the Sermon on the Way down at a level spot. Some scholars believe that they are the same sermon, while others hold that Jesus frequently preached similar themes in different places. Although modern parallels between the teachings of Jesus and Buddhist philosophy have been drawn, these comparisons emerged after missionary contacts in the 19th century, and there is no historically reliable evidence of contacts between Buddhism and Jesus during his life. Modern scholarship has almost unanimously agreed that claims of the travels of Jesus to Tibet, Kashmir or India and the influence of Buddhism on his teachings are without historical basis. The similarities between the teachings of Buddha and Jesus have been noted. On this subject, Bible scholar Marcus Borg and Buddhist Jack Kornfield collaborate in a book, Jesus and Buddha, The Parallel Sayings. According to perennialist author Friedjof Schuon, the message of the sermon is a perfect synthesis of the whole Christian tradition. The text has the largest number of perennial and universal doctrines, and spiritual advice of all scripture. Much of what Bible readers remember from scripture derives from the sermon. Source of spiritual and moral instructions, the Sermon on the Mount is regarded by the perennial philosophy as the quintessence itself of religion. Perennialism considers the injunctions of the Sermon on the Mount as belonging to the esoteric dimension of Christianity. Thanks for watching. Don't forget like the video and don't forget to subscribe.